Well, the world economy is tanked. India's on lockdown. The Summer Olympics have been postponed. New York City's the hotbed for COVID-19 right now in the United States. And, well, that's a lot that's happened since your big win at uh, Mid-South. How are you doing, Payson? Uh, I'm good in the scheme of things. <clears throat> I certainly wish there was racing right around the corner, but um, I think, you know, everyone needs to keep some perspective at the moment as as much as we can. And I realize that I'm in a very privileged position and I'm healthy. Um, I still have my career um, and I'm, you know, doing everything I can to, to be an active, responsible participant in this global uh, situation. Um, so yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing well, you know, it, it's a, it's a strange time. I think we're going to learn a lot about ourselves and a lot about humanity as a whole during this time. Um, I'm kind of eternally an optimist. So I hope that we'll come out of this, uh, with some, some silver linings in terms of lessons and maybe some ways that things actually get better, big picture, um, as compared to, to things before, but who knows? I think that's kind of the one of the major aspects here is no one no one really knows what's going on or what to expect or what's going to happen. Even even the experts are trying to figure it all out. So um, I think like everybody else, I'm living a little bit more day to day right now. I was just going to say, I was like, man, for for my athletes, for myself, it is a bit day to day because you know the information is always changing in terms of, you know, what we can expect and what, what the news is, you know, coming out from around the world. So, um, but yeah, to your point, I, I hope that it's, it's a unique thing, right? Like once in a lifetime sort of situation with the pandemic, hopefully, you know, knock on wood, once in a lifetime that this is happening and which is why there's no playbook for it. And we do have to come together, uh, as a global society to figure this thing out. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. Absolutely. Well, uh, with, with that kind of prelude, uh, I, I do want to thank you for, you know, joining us on the train, right podcast. You, you've been someone that I've been wanting to, to get on the podcast for a while because you do bike racing in North America. So, so differently and, and so fantastic, uh, in comparison to some, some of them out there. So, you know, we haven't introduced you just yet. Could you, uh, introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I am Payson McKelvin, and I am a 27-year-old off-road professional racer. I have to say off-road these days uh, because it's both mountain bike and gravel at this point. Um, basically, everything non-pavement uh, that is endurance-related is my realm these days. Um, I started out with a, more of a cross-country focus, and then um, as I started to learn more about the pref professional opportunities uh, in the industry um, and new opportunities that were arising and new types of events that were surfacing. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about some of the longer distance grassroots stuff. Um, I started to gravitate a little bit more towards that. Um, I won a couple of professional national titles in, in marathon mountain biking, and that very much uh, pushed me towards more of the endurance stuff. Um, it sort of branded me to an extent, even without me really necessarily wanting it at that point, but I, I warmed up to it in regards to being the quote unquote endurance guy rather than the, you know, cross country world cup style guy. And then in the last few years, we've seen this major, major explosion of gravel racing, um, which is a little bit of a, um, misnomer, I think, because, Gravel racing, to me, is mostly just uh, non-paved racing because you've got an unbelievable spectrum of events that kind of fall under the umbrella of gravel. On one end of the spectrum, you've got something like the Belgian Waffle Ride, which is, I don't know, 85 90% paved, but also mm -hmm. has single track in it. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you have something like the Leadville 100, which I feel like is kind of the original gravel race, or uh, some of the Grinduro events where people actually are riding mountain bikes uh, to win. So it's kind of all over the map, and I enjoy all of it. And um, for all intents and purposes, I'm just trying to do all of the biggest events that seem to have the largest impact and have 
the most participants um, and the most number of people that, that seem to care about the events. And, and these days, that seems to be either, you know, World Cup racing um, or uh, some of this longer distance uh, stuff that I just mentioned. Hmm. Yeah. So as our audience can 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 tell i mean it's a pretty diverse discipline that you race but it's also very very approachable because you're out there racing a lot of the same races that a lot of these age groupers uh masters racers are, are doing and so that's that's um that's my vision for this podcast today is is to uh talk about you uh your team and also the podcast and your brand that, that we're doing um so before we even get into some of those basin I want to go back a little bit even further. I want to go back to your Texas upbringing and like how you got into this whole bike racing thing. Tell us, tell us how that happened. Yeah. So, uh, let's see when I was about five or six years old, um, my dad was doing some mountain bike racing. He'd actually been a really high level track and field athlete, uh, some sustained some injuries that pushed him towards kayaking uh, he spent a good number of years kind of as a pioneering kayaker. And then after injuries pushed him out of that, he went into cycling. And uh, in the early 90s is really when, when mountain biking was exploding. And so uh, he was right there uh, in lockstep with it. And as a very young kid, um, I would go watch some of his events. I just have vague memories of that. And then I jumped into one event um, when I was six years old. So that was my first ever race. But I actually didn't race again after that one uh, for eight years. Um, my dad has uh, an autoimmune disease that um, really flared up there from, oh, I don't know, the, the mid-90s into the early 2000s and made it so that he wasn't able to do any physical activity. And because he wasn't oh. doing it, I, I didn't really know uh, what, was, what was out there in terms of cycling to an extent until... Uh, Lance Armstrong started winning all the tours and then it became front and center again. And so I, I just started kind of riding around uh, on the road some because I was inspired just on our little neighborhood roads, you know, impersonating Phil Liggett and Paul Sherwin and pretending <laughs> like I was Lance attacking the shit out of Jan Ulrich. Um, <laughs> at the same we all time, did. We all did. Exactly. At the same time, um, I was definitely really enjoying more traditional sports because those were available uh, at school. So track and field, basketball, flag football, a little bit of uh, cross country running for just one semester in high school. Those are all things that I participated in. Um, but around age 14, no, maybe it was 12 or 13, um, I was in... Uh, well, I was visiting this place called the Nantahala Outdoor Center, in North Carolina, which is a, a big whitewater kayaking and rafting park that um, my family has some connection to. And, and we were just out there on vacation and they had a bike shop. And in the bike shop, there was this uh, free ride video playing called Rome by The Collective. And I was just transfixed. And when we got home, finally, uh, after that vacation, I just had to have a real mountain bike. And I had to go out into the yard and start building jumps. Um, and so I rode a BMX bike for a little while and then a mountain bike more and um, slowly but surely just developed this uh, insatiable passion for mountain biking. Um, and I just, for some reason, decided that I wanted to combine the cool, jumpy oriented stuff of, of that free ride and BMX world that, was, that I was inspired by with the fitness related uh style of cycling that i was also inspired by which was lance winning the tours and the the natural combination of those two things in my mind was cross-country racing um and i was i was always talking about it and i was constantly telling my dad that i was going to be world champion and win all these races and he said well you should probably try racing again if you're if you want to do this professionally <laughs> so finally when i was 14 um i did my first ever uh, mountain bike race again um I was having some knee injuries playing basketball around the same time. So that sort of nudged me towards the bike more also. And, uh, yeah, kind of the rest was history. I did my first local Texas series race and, um, it was exactly, I don't know why, but it was exactly what I wanted and exactly what I needed at the time. And I just really 
applied myself and um, haven't looked back since, I suppose. Yeah, well, it's it's a as I hear that story, you know, about you because I know a little bit about your background and and whatnot. But I mean, it speaks to the diversity that you you know have also in terms of ability in this sport, combined with um, how social media, the diversity of racing, the the rise of gravel, and kind of how to market yourself has all come into this time where pacing can be who he is today and it's it's pretty cool to see that you know it's it's really fun to see because where you know where i met you our our connection we we have a unique connection where um i was a team director for the show air mountain bike team at the time and and they were rebranding going toward this ride biker program Mm -hmm. and the mountain bike uh the, the mountain bike scene was moving toward uh privateer and that's what the program uh, offered for. I don't even remember what year that was. And um, from and you were you were top notch then. You know we had a big squad, all kind of privateers. It's like ah, Payson's different. You know Payson's yeah. different. And um, it's been cool to see you flourish uh, over the years as well. And now on to uh, the Orange Seal off road team. Yeah. And um, that's been it's been super fun to to kind of see you grow and develop as, as a bike racer. And, um, and I think you're having a lot of fun doing it. Oh yeah. Hugely. It, it's funny because, um, you know, you mentioning some of that historical context is, is helpful because I'm sure you can relate to this, but as someone that's achievement oriented and highly motivated, uh, oftentimes you're just looking forward and just really attacking the future and making plans and executing as best you can. And, and just trying to achieve. And sometimes we forget to look back. And uh, I, I have some fear of failure, for sure. I, I think that's a motivator for me. And so um, I, I'm always looking to do more. And I think it is helpful now and then to, to look back and realize where you were just a couple years ago, um, five years ago, one year ago, whatever it is, I think looking back is a, is a really good exercise. Um, so it is funny to think back, you know, ride biker was in the scheme of things just a few years ago. Um, and and it's 2016, 17, yeah. Uh, 16, 17. Yeah. Um, I think 2016 was that the year with the really big team. And then 2017, uh, we kind of went our separate ways, but still had the ride biker structure there to to help us out. Um, but yeah, it's funny. I mean, it, it very frequently, people still say, so how do you make a privateer program or how do you like privateering? And I'm like, privateering, I don't feel like I've been a privateer in ages, but it was only Mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, and, and during that time, uh, putting together my own program like that just seemed, uh, natural. Like it, to me, it wasn't, um, a necessity of survival. It was what I wanted to do. And it was a necessity of survival. Like that was my path. That was the way that I was going to find success. But also it was if I had the choice. And and at one point I did actually have the choice uh, to, to ride for um, a more traditional factory team. And I, I turned it down at the time because I liked the freedom of being able to create my own program and be my own boss and all that sort of thing. But um, I, I was so focused on that. And then, uh, as, as more success came, Orange Seal asked whether they could take ownership of the program and start looking at adding a rider or two and take all the logistical stuff off my plate. And um, I thought that sounded like a, a pretty good deal. And, you know, a couple of years on, three years on, um, we are one of, if not the biggest, most well-supported uh, North American programs in the country, I think. Um, and it, it's funny because it feels like home and it feels really stable and I feel really good about the ecosystem there, but it is funny. And I think important to remember that just a few years ago, it looked a lot different for sure. <laughs> it did. It did. And, and speaking of looking different, uh, one of the big reasons why we're talking today is, uh, things look different out there today, right now. Yeah. with with COVID-19 just wreaking havoc uh, in, in the world. So if, if you don't mind me asking, I mean, uh, how has life changed for you as a professional athlete? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, to be totally honest, not much. Um, but I think that's because, as you alluded to earlier, I operate my career a little bit differently. Um, yeah. Training and racing are still absolutely number one. And if I have a really busy day and I have too many things scheduled, training and racing are not what get sacrificed first. It's other things. That said, I dedicate a huge amount of time to a bunch of other stuff. And so, uh, boy, to be honest. Like what? Um, well, it this doesn't narrow it down very much, but just quickly hmm. at face value, content creation is massive. So um, yeah, yeah. that can be everything from the podcast that I thought was going to be a fun little side thing, which turned into something way bigger. Uh, it could be the Family Seal YouTube series that the team just launched, um, uh, inspired by Jeremy Powers' Behind the Barriers series that y'all may remember from from years past. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be launching, and that's owned and operated by the team. I just provide feedback. Um, and then I'm going to be launching my own YouTube series uh, in April. That's breaking news. No one knows that yet. Um <laughs> uh i mean instagram at this point takes up i'm inclined to say too too much time but it that's not fair to say either because it's such an opportunity and it's it's been such a blessing for someone in my position um it it is between crafting a post for the day it say say there's no video related which always requires hours and hours of editing say it's just a photo yeah just selecting the photo, writing a good caption, um, just going through all the nuts and bolts of that takes at least an hour a day. And then answering, <clears throat> excuse me, answering direct messages, comments, all that sort of thing. Um, I try to budget an hour a day for that also, but it easily could balloon to two or three hours. Um, that's kind of a different conversation. But as soon as you give someone an answer, they tend to think, uh, they have a captive audience and you're their best friend and you can carry on a conversation for the next few hours right, it's right. Tricky when there's many of those people in your inbox. So that, um, that's a huge, but, huge time suck. Um, what else? Yeah, and, that, and that's all part of your job. I mean, the way you do it and the way we do it um, on the professional scene, especially off road. I mean, that's, that's a big part of the job. Oh, huge. These days. Hugely. Yeah. And, and, I, I don't think there are too, too many. Um, I don't know that there are that many people in in my, I don't think I have that many peers that understand the full uh, picture of all that, like why it does matter and why it can be such a positive thing for their career. Um, one thing I've had the real good fortune of, of having some exposure to is since I signed with Red Bull, I've gotten to be friends with, um, some of the best athletes from all different kinds of sports. And I think it's really easy for racers in the cycling world to, to um, feel like their little world is the only world or the only world that they need to pay attention to. I know I, I certainly felt that way. Um, and once I started to branch out and, and get exposure to these other sports, I realized, wow, we have a lot to learn from backcountry skiers or the skateboard world or BMX riders or surfers or, you know, whatever it is. Um, the truth of the matter is uh, non mainstream stick and ball sports. There, there are um, examples of, of sports that are way ahead of us in regards to professional opportunities, the size of the ecosystem, um, all that sort of thing. And so I just really started, once I recognized that, I really aggressively started educating myself and, and researching um, some of the ways that these other athletes from different sports were, were being successful, whether it be in their actual performance of their sport or the business side, the marketing side, the branding side, whatever. And I just started getting a better understanding of, of uh, how all of those different parts in, in 2020 and beyond can work together. Um, to give you a real career and a career that actually has an impact um, beyond a number on a results sheet, which is mostly how most bike racers uh, in my position think. 
Exactly. And that's, and that's a big part of why I wanted to, like I said, bring you on this episode, because I think a lot of our audience think professional bike racers, though, they, they train really hard and long and then they sleep and then they get results and then they're, maybe they have contracts and they're successful, whatever. But for you, the reason why I ask is like, okay, how has your life changed right now? Not a ton because you're super busy, super slam, probably busier than ever, uh, producing content and doing kind of the other aspect of your job, the bigger aspect, which, um, which is the, the content storytelling and, um, doing your thing. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think it's also important to note that, um, it's not just these quote unquote action sports or niche sports that, um, have athletes that are, are going beyond the actual performance of their sport. I think of someone like LeBron James, who in the middle of his NBA season is filming Space Jam 2, or, or is it Space Jam 3? I can't remember. Um, I don't know. Or opening, you know, um, what's his, Blaze Pizza, like one of the biggest uh, food chains in the country now. Like the, And he's filming ads for Nike and, and all of these things. And um, I, I just think that the the cycling world and this is a very narrow audience that I'm kind of speaking to at this point because it's mostly my peers but I I think we have a lot to learn from sports outside of cycling um I I love this sport so so much um but I think it's sometimes tradition bound to a fault um and it's really exciting to see pioneering riders that are uh pushing the boundaries. And and there are plenty of examples. Like for example, Peter Sagan, um, Hmm. is is a classic example. Like the the dude can win left, right and center, but winning is, is almost secondary to him. And I've had some interesting conversations with, uh, riders who have, uh, been on the team with him in the past, whether it was liquid gas or four hands go or whatever. And, um, Every single time they say that they don't think that guy actually cares that much about bike racing. And he's just that talented that it, it doesn't matter as much. Um, but he, he wants to be a businessman. He wants to be a Hollywood star. Like those are the things that drive him. And he understands that winning races is what he has to do to, to position himself to open those doors. But, um, you know, there's, there's so many examples like Rebecca Rush, for example. I don't think that many people lined up. Uh, at the USA Cycling Cross Country Mountain Bike National Championships or the Sea Otter Classic Cross Country XCO understand fully the impact that that woman has had on mountain biking. Um, they they maybe don't see her in the New York Times. They maybe don't see her, um, you know, doing TED Talks, but she's like... Yet, yet. Right. Well, no, she, <laughs> I'm saying that she has and, and they just yeah. haven't noticed um that's why we need to like that, that's what i'm saying yeah they like because their minds need to be yeah, open and yeah, they need to and see that and i don't know but i agree with you like the people like the cross-country mountain bike racers like we need to open our minds man for sure and one thing that i'm really excited about is is we're in we're in such an exciting time for cross-country also because uh red bull and red bull tv have have i think really hit the sweet spot in terms of making it spectator friendly you know, for so yeah, long, they were 100%. trying to make a participation sport, a spectator sport. And they finally made uh, cross country non-bike racing, a spectator sport. I mean, it's, you can't deny the size of the crowds at European world cups and you can't deny the, the viewership online for those world cup events. It's awesome. But they really had to change the UCI really had to change the style of racing into a really man-made short lap style thing. Um, and so we kind of have these two differing paths now where it's grassroots, mass participation, dirty Kanza, where you've got, uh, 5,000 people on the start line and 15,000 plus people at the expo area. And that has a ginormous impact, or you have the world cup style and you can kind of go, um, either route. And what I'm really, really excited for is, um, on the women's side for the United States, I mean, we're just absolutely killing it literally number one ranked country in the world. And we have so many star athletes, but obviously Kate uh, is kind of leading the way and she gets it. Like she understands the value of all of this other stuff that I just mentioned. And so she's combining being world champion with, um, all of the, the off bike stuff. 
And uh, I think it could be a really special time for cycling, um, off-road cycling, period. Uh, obviously, we're seeing a massive groundswell of participation in the dirty Kansas of the world and the Leadville 100s of the world. But um, I think with the combination of NICA and some of the success that we're, that the country is finally seeing on the World Cup stage again, um, I think it's it's really exciting times for sure. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, one of the questions I had for you is like, how's you, you know, how's the motivation right now with with racing kind of going away, and then you kind of have to re change everything. How is the motivation right now? But you sound stoked, so maybe that's the answer. Yeah. Right ah, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, you know, just rewinding quickly, when sure. I had my first major success, um, winning that first professional national title, I expected to be on cloud nine and just on fire the rest of the year, both physically and mentally. And, and the opposite kind of happened, not so much physically, but mentally, I just really slipped into these post success doldrums, actually dealt with some low grade depression, um, and just felt kind of lost. And at the time, I was like, what the heck is wrong with me? And, and uh, the more I talk to people, and, and I have a mindset coach who I rely on still, um, the more I realize that that's perfectly normal. Um, and so after the major success of Mid-South, the first race of the year, and uh, potentially one of the onlyest, or one of the only, we'll, we'll see, um, <laughs> I, it was, uh, was kind of similar. And, and I think um, to an extent, as you mature as a professional, you grow out of that and you realize you just have to show up and do the job and you become, you start racing a little bit less out of emotion and more with just a professional attitude, you know, you get in, you get the job done, um, and, and you get out and you prepare for the next one. Um, but, uh, that race required emotion. Um, there, there had to be some emotional fuel there too, to get through that one because it was so nasty. It was so, the conditions were so heinous. Um, that you just really had to have a, a good attitude and really want to be there and really want to be challenged by those unique circumstances. Um, and for, for, for our audience members who do, don't know mid South, go yeah. to Payson's Instagram and just check out the gnarly photos from there. You get a, a good sense of what he's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I did really want to be there. I, I was, I was as fired up emotionally as I have been for an event in a long, long time. Um, and part of that too was, uh, the passing of, uh, my dear friend, uh, Ben Sontag, not too much earlier. And, um, I made yeah. the completely impossible decision to, um, stay down South, um, when they announced that his service was actually going to be the same day as the race back in Durango. Um, Oof. we went back and forth on that decision, um, as a team manager and I, I mean, for days, um, yeah. but because I decided to stay and, and race. Um, I just felt this enormous obligation to, uh, to leave every piece of me out on that course. So anyway, to get back, to get back to your answer or your question, which is what Ben would have wanted. Let's, let's, yeah. Face it. yeah. And that's ultimately why I made the decision. Yeah. Um, I talked to a couple folks, um, who were closest to him and, and they really urged me to, to do the event. Um, so anyway, uh, to answer your question, after finishing yep. that event, man, I was just flatlined. Like I, <laughs> emotionally, sure. physically, there was nothing left uh, for several days. Um, but the weird circumstance this time around is that it didn't really matter uh, because racing's on hiatus. And so my, my coach, who always has had incredible perspective, said, man, you don't have to rush into anything. Like soak this in, um, enjoy it and start riding again when you feel like it. Um, and for the first week, I, I really didn't feel like training. And then the funny thing that happened is I have such ripping form right now <laughs> that it's <just laughs> fun to go ride my bike. And yeah. uh, I've done some rides where I literally stopped and recalibrated my power meter because I was like, I'm pretty sure this is reading high. Um, yeah. But when, when the legs are that good, it's just really fun to ride hard. And so... Um, the, the motivation to do really specific structured riding isn't quite back yet, but the, the desire to just like go sit on high endurance or low tempo for a long time, um, 
is is there and luckily yeah. you know that's the sort of training that's that we should be doing right now anyway with not knowing when we're racing next yeah well i mean sage advice from christian williams at um williams racing academy and you've been working with him for quite quite a while now right like 10 plus years Dude, yeah, right? it's crazy yeah. i think technically it's 12 years which is 12 years amazing yeah. crazy yeah. first and only bike coach yeah, no, I, I love that. I love that. Well, I you know, I was going to ask how many, sorry, just funny side note. Talk yeah, about yeah. It. I'm sure you get this sometimes too. I've had sure. people write me on Instagram and say, hey, so this such and such person says that they coach you. And I was wondering whether you could give some feedback on, on whether you think they'd be a good coach. And it's someone that like I did a clinic with or, um, you know, a collegiate, <laughs> a collegiate coach that like handed me bottles sure. once. Right. Like, right. uh, no, nope, that person doesn't coach me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you get that sometimes too. <laughs> well, no one claims that they coach me. Well, well I mean, people, me. <laughs> yeah, people, people take, people probably take credit, uh, when, when the credit should go to you. <laughs> yes. Yes. No, absolutely. And that's, and that's a tricky thing to, to navigate when you are, you know, reaching, reaching the higher levels of sports such as yourself, um, or such as Kate Courtney, as you mentioned, and uh, as I mentioned uh, just before we started podcasting, um, Kate and Jim, her coach, are coming on uh, the the next episode. So everybody tune into that. But the reason why I mentioned Christian is because he's he's played a huge role in your in your in your life, and coaches do. Um, I mean, they they can be the bedrock, you know, at times. And you know, I've I've directed uh, two teams now with, with you on it. And Christian has always uh, come back to be, you know, a a huge talking point in in somebody that you rely upon, which is why I want to bring, you know, bring that aspect up. Um, and so, uh, you know, he's often an unsung hero. Um, we have to spend a lot of time promoting our sponsors and, and promoting events and promoting teammates and all that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the coaches are kind of the, the the rocks that that just sit back there when you need them um and otherwise yeah. keep a pretty low profile so we're yeah. lucky to have we're, we're the, you we're, we're the old line man it's yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, our, so our job so, so um but uh so you mentioned some of the training that you've been doing you said kind of like long grindy stuff not too structured and, and you said that sh- that is the stuff that we should be doing right now why why do you say that well I, I shouldn't tell other people what they should be doing, but it's one. No, you should. This is why they're here. They're here to listen to professional, yeah. get some advice. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a huge conversation uh, in terms of the way we've changed my training over the last few years. Um, just a, a brief outline. So I grew up in central Texas, uh, which is um, for all intents and purposes, very flat. It's, it's called the Texas Hill country um, because it's constant rolling two to three minute hills. But for, also, for, for most people, it's considered very flat. Um, and our trails there are also flat, obviously, with lots of rock gardens and um, very twisty. <clears throat> and so developing as a young rider there, I think it's part physio- physiological and then also part just environment. Um, I developed into this really power-oriented, punchy style rider um, that didn't have much of a, a threshold engine or long distance. Um, well, that's not true. I, I had fine endurance, but in terms of like, um, 60, 120 minute power, even 20, 30 minute power, I was really lacking there. Um, and I knew that to turn this into a career because so many of the biggest events require real climbing. Um, and just because at the end of the day, pretty much all bike racing comes down to who has the higher threshold power. Um, I knew I needed to get into the mountains and I needed to get better at these longer sustained efforts. So um, I moved to Durango, Colorado and really sucked at climbing for a long time. I could beat just about any off-road racer in a sprint, um, but I would usually get dropped on a long climb before I even had an opportunity to get to a sprint. So um, the combination of moving to Durango and then Christian, my coach, recognizing the deficiency and then just really dedicating ourselves to shoring that up over the course of the last five, eight years, um, we haven't made it a strength, but, um, you know, I, I can climb with 
on a good day, I can climb with just about uh, any of my competitors um, in the country. I've podiumed at the Leadville 100 a couple times, which is notoriously very climb heavy, obviously. Um, yeah. And, you know, eight years ago, I probably wouldn't have even completed that event. So um, yeah. that and then also as my career sort of uh, took more of a trajectory towards the longer distance stuff, um, I just really had to develop this big engine diesel power. And so for all intents and purposes, we've trained out that uh, like one minute power that used to be, my coach always said, your one minute power is freakish. Like when I was a teenager, I had world tour watts per kilo at a one minute duration, but that's not super useful unless you have the threshold power to get yourself into a position where you can win a race. So anyway, point being, um, I don't have quite the world-class talent of someone that might be able to have both of those things simultaneously. So we've sort of had to um, move my strengths on the spectrum more towards big engine diesel type ability. And so we just started doing tons and tons of uh, sub-threshold work, just hour after hour after hour after hour of sub-threshold work. Um, and now it's a strength, you know, now I can be six hours, eight hours into an event and, and still able to sit on a, a very high power and compete with, um, some of these riders that are in these gravel events these days, or even some of the mountain bike events that, you know, have race grand tours and, and, uh, Belgian classics and all that sort of thing and had opportunities to, to basically develop that sort of fitness, um, in the best possible environment. And we just had to like grind to get there. And it came simply by virtue of, of focusing on it. Um, so that's kind of what I would yeah. do. Yeah, no, that's, I, I love, I love hearing that because I can't remember, I don't can't remember if it was Johnny Muller, if I was talking to Damo, but they, they were, uh, we were at a bike race and, and uh, a few uh, months in and they're like, who, so who is pacing? I'm like, the kid has like wicked anaerobic capacity, like wicked. I go, but is like his. It's weird because he's like there late in the game, and and if it's like a stupid, hard, dumb race where the conditions are terrible, like Payson's there. If it's if he's there, if he can get to the line and take in a sprint, like he is there. But if it's like the typical cross country uh, thing, I'm like, I he's kind of inconsistent. Yeah, <laughs> this sure. Several years yeah. ago, and and I remember talking to you a little bit about that as well. But you know, and and I think what you talked about with, with Christian, how you framed up the training, it's a very long term approach like that. When you have a really high talented athlete and you have a young athlete, you have to play the long game with that and develop them. And maybe you know, maybe threshold will never be a true strength, but it, you have now made it less of a weakness, or if you you have made it less of a limiter now to where your strengths can shine through. For sure, yeah. You know, and that's a strength that I've seen you be able to develop and, and, and produce, uh, over the years. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I, w I would agree with that. Um, and so to kind of just tie up that conversation about why we're doing a bunch of these, you know, tempo endurance rides. And when I, when I, just to give an example, you know, a, a, a pretty yep. typical training ride, um, these days, <clears throat> and honestly, it's like, <laughs> At, at this point in my career and at this point in the year, um, well, not usually at this point in the year, but anytime we're between races, it's, it's basically three to four days a week, um, are three to six hour rides with at least two hours of tempo in there. Sometimes it's like four by 30 minutes. Sometimes it's, it's one by three hour effort or sorry, three by, by one hour tempo efforts. It's just really piling on, um, this, this tempo work. Um, and then as you get closer to events, it's a little more sweet spot. And then you toss in a little bit of threshold stuff, a little bit of VO two to sharpen up so that you can follow attacks and make attacks. But for all intents and purposes, we're just dedicating all of our time to building big aerobic capacity. Um, because it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter if you can hit 1500 Watts, uh, when, when you're fresh, if, there's six hours of racing between the start line and when you're going to try to do 1500 Watts. Um, I think the, the main differentiator between, uh, professionals and, and non-professional racers is just the size of the engine. Like how many times can you make, how many, t how many times can you spend 
10, 15 minutes at your threshold power over and over, over the course of three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours, whatever it is, 10 hours if it's Kanza. Um, there's a right. ton of amateur racers out there that could for sure out sprint me. Like, absolutely. Um, but there aren't very many that could out sprint uh, us after six hours. So I think that's kind well, of the difference. I tell my athletes this absolutes don't matter in a world full of relativity. <laughs> I love that. Yep. And, and the thing is, is yeah, I mean, the sprint doesn't matter if you can't get to the line. Right. And it's in a, we, we, you know, we, we talk about fatigue resistance. Uh, we talk about power for repeatability, but that's, that's just it. And that's what makes my opinion, um, a really good athlete is how relative, good they are how gritty they are how tough they are and that's and that's again your style of racing and the events that you do require that so um yeah it's, it's good to hear uh you know what you're doing on the bike right now i also know that you know you, you make a lot of trips down to santa monica in you know, the red bull lab and in things like that you're clearly not going to the gym these days but what what are you doing for strength training right now um you know, it's been hard. I'm not going to lie. Um, I've been, well, to be totally honest, I've just been doing less and it's not because I want to sure. be doing less. It's because I've been down in Austin, um, at my parents' house quarantining. I didn't want to come, uh, directly back to Durango, Smart. Colorado, um, following mid South, um, because you know, there was, a lot of discussion about the circumstances there. That event fell on the weekend when the shit was really hitting the fan and um, it put it, everyone in a really challenging position. And um, basically uh, right as it was hitting the airwaves of how serious all of this was, um, we were at an event with 2000 people. And so I, I wanted to come home back to Texas uh, where I'd been before the event and uh and just kind of try to do the responsible thing, hang out for a couple of weeks, make sure I hadn't picked up the bug before going back to Durango, which is a small isolated town that fortunately doesn't have any COVID-19 cases yet. And the last thing I'd want to do is be the person to bring it back there. So um, I, I, uh, I was at my folks house, like I said, for the last couple of weeks and, and doing stuff um, honestly with uh, <laughs> really Rocky Balboa inspired um, nice. People. So as an example, um, well, my folks live on, on 20 acres for all intents and purposes. It's a little mini ranch. And so there's like big, uh, fence posts laying around, for example, they only weigh maybe 60, 70 pounds, but, um, that's, that's better than nothing. So just doing some squats with those, um, we do have a medicine ball there. So getting creative with that, um, some rubber bands are available, um, just, just doing what I can focusing, uh, a lot on body weight stuff. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> I really got silly with it and published, uh, a little spoof video on Instagram recently that is Rocky inspired where I'm pulling my dad's tractor with my bike, for example. Um, I'm, I have my mom on my shoulders and I'm doing squats as she cleans the gutters. Um, nice. I'm sprinting around the chicken coop trying to catch a chicken because that's a classic Rocky thing. So, so I was going to ask how how sore were you after uh, chasing the chicken around? Because that I mean there were some jukes and jives in there. <laughs> you know I was doing all right. I think I have just enough. Uh, <laughs> I have just enough basketball still in my legs that yeah. Um, I was I was all right. It's all about workload, you know. You, I didn't I didn't chase too many chickens that day. Got to ease in. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Once you hit 30, man, you chase a chicken, you will oh, feel that. It's coming just up saying. fast. Coming up fast. But anyway, just <laughs> close the loop on that. Now that I'm back in, in Durango, yeah. I have a little bit more equipment to work with and we have a, a room here dedicated to that. So um, we don't have a squat rack, for example. That's something that I'll, I'll certainly miss. Um, but we have started doing uh, some more weighted front squat stuff and like falling into a one-legged squat position and some different things like that where you can kind of work with the grain um, even when traditional gym equipment isn't available. Um, but I think it's also important to note that um, it's really easy to overcomplicate all this stuff. And I think a lot of people see all of the gadgets and gizmos in the Red Bull gym and assume that 
we're like doing squats with electrodes on ourselves and like lasers and shit but it's not really the case like at the end of the day we focus on the basics and all of those bells and whistles are you know the sprinkles you put on top of the the sunday at the end um it's the cherry on top and all of those things help track progress and help a lot with recovery um but there is no shortcut to this stuff and because of that um it's actually I think it's almost an opportunity being stuck at home, an opportunity to get back to the basics and do stuff like really break down your squat form, like get a, get a little PVC pipe and a mirror and do an overhead squat and watch a couple videos on good form and really be honest with yourself about how good your squat is. And chances are good. It's not good. <laughs> Likely yeah, that especially it's, if you ride bikes a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, if you focus on that, just freaking air squats, dude, if you do enough of those, make a huge difference, um, as I'm sure you know. So uh, I guess my message would be, um, and I've said this before in regards to riding inside, no one really likes to ride. In, well, more people like to ride inside these days because Zwift is sweet. But um, by and large, True. I feel like these these weird times can be used as an opportunity also to get back to basics. Um, and that's how I'll be, that's what I'll try to be focusing on. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good advice. I couldn't agree with you more. And in a separate podcast, uh, I just, you know, I, I commented that said, um, a lot of us, uh, both professional athletes that are getting after it in all of areas of life, such as yourself, masters level racer, Ironman athlete. I mean, we're all, you, you turn up to the the race venue and everybody complains about the the lack of time that they've had or the other busy busyness in their life. And right now, you know, this COVID thing will run its it'll it'll keep on going for a while. But many people have a lot more time yeah. time to sleep and get back to the basics. And that's that's my messaging to a lot of people is like take advantage of that time. You know, absolutely. And I'm like I said, I'm usually an eternally optimistic person, but I think this whole yeah phase is going to teach us a lot about ourselves and teach us a lot about humanity. And I will be curious to see um, how much people actually do buck up and take the opportunity, or are they going to exhaust their Netflix library? Like that's a very, and, and I have no judgment yeah. there, right? Like it's, it's uh, yeah, no judgment. It, it's your choice. And I understand that there are people out there that are, are struggling with, all kinds of different things that I don't have to, whether it be uh, losing a career or general anxiety or, you know, a loved one that's vulnerable, whatever it is. Um, that said, you, at the end of the day, you are your own gatekeeper and the opportunity is there. And like, it's really simple, but it's really hard. All you have to do is reach out and take it. Um, and, and because it's so simple, I think sometimes it's, it's, uh, that makes it harder, but um, I always just say nothing to it, but to do it. So just go do it. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Well, let's, let's pivot now and talk about, talk about 2020. Let's talk about the race season. And if, if I may dare, uh, ask you to speculate, uh, where all of this is going, because I mean, some of the races that you focus on and mentioned already, like Leadville, um, Breck Epic. Uh, yeah, I don't think you've done that one just yet, but Bentonville, the Epic Ride Series, which is one of my favorite race series, um, and then the new Bentonville uh, Big Sugar. Uh, where where is everything going, and what's going to happen? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I have some partnerships with some of these events, and so I've, I'm actually pretty plugged in at this point. I've had lots of conversations over the last week or two about their concerns and and um, their proposed problem solving measures and all that sort of thing. And even still, uh, no one really knows <laughs> the quote, yeah. quote experts that are on the front line to an extent don't know how to solve this thing yet. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's a matter of patience, but, um, I think <clears throat> what's likely is that those of us that do this full time and, um, have uh, participation in these events as one of the really important parts of our job, we will have a very, very busy late summer and fall. <laughs> um, yeah. We've already seen uh, 
a handful of the biggest events get rescheduled. Um, and unfortunately, one of them scheduled on top of another one. Uh, the Belgian Waffle Ride has been now scheduled on top of the Iceman Cometh race, both of which were on my schedule. Um, and that's going to be a, a really, really hard decision. Um, but I think, um, I, th yeah, I, I, I th it's so hard to say. For some reason, I have this weird hunch, and this might be a little overly optimistic, but I have this weird hunch that Dirty Kanza might be our first race back. Um, if if that's too soon, it'll be be the stuff in late July, like uh, cross country nationals and, and that sort of thing. But it's almost not even worth speculating at this point because we have we just don't know. I mean, you, we can look at the arc of of the way China got through this, for example. But you know, who knows how forthcoming they're being with with how things are actually there you know they say they haven't had any positive cases in a week or whatever it's been and that their economy is is rocketing back up but um you know i think we have to take that information with a grain of salt probably so um we'll see i i think uh kate put it pretty well recently where she said something along the lines of what do you do when when things go sideways and plans change and the answer is you keep showing up because that's what we do yeah um, yep. show up and be prepared and, and be ready to rock when the opportunity presents itself. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good advice. And I think, um, you know, whether you are, uh, fighting for the Olympics, which I, I'd probably ask you a question on that here in a minute, or, you, you know, you're gearing up for dirty cons or whatever it's, it's stay ready so that you don't have to get ready when racing comes back on, Yep. you know? Um, and so with the late season, probably potentially and fingers crossed late season focus with, you know, uh, race weekend after race weekend in conjunction with the Olympics being postponed. Uh, I know you're not, you're not personally fighting for a spot, but you're banging elbows and racing against the people who are, uh, how do you, how do you think that'll change, uh, the dynamic of the men's and women's field? I mean, Key and Kate and all these uh, folk out there in terms of, you know, getting the race days in their legs and as well as the UCI points, um, in terms of gearing up for a potential 2021 Olympics that will still be called 2020 Olympics. Oh, will they really? That's, I, I heard that on NPR. Um, and it was primarily due to like all of the banners and shirts and stuff that they can't like, they'll take a big wash, you know, if they have to rebrand that. That, and that's just what they're saying right now. Who knows? That's funny. Um, yeah. Boy, again, it's just so hard to say. You know, yeah, um, yeah. I think I think it depends a lot on. So, okay, so speaking to the folks that are vying for the Olympics, I think it, it sure. depends a lot on how World Cups get rescheduled. Um, if it turns into this really condensed World Cup season, if I were in their shoes, I would just focus one hundred percent on that um, because yeah. what what you kind of have is. People, uh, I think, I think people think, oh, you know, the Olympics are in 2021 now. We have all of this time. But from a physical preparation standpoint, if those World Cups get condensed into say July through October or whatever it is, that's like what 16 months? No, not even. I mean, it's not even. I was it, gonna say it, that's a short time. It's a, it's a very, uh, it, it's weird. It's just so unprecedented, and so. If, if I were vying for the Olympics, I personally would have to stay really focused on that style of racing still. Um, that said, you know, it would be very cool to see Kate or Keegan or, or whoever else show up to some of these um, other events that they typically wouldn't <clears throat> have the opportunity to, whether it be a Leadville 100 or uh, even a, a Dirty Cans or something like that. But I think it's more likely that they would jump into those sorts of things the year after the Olympics. So 2022. Um, but uh, we'll just have to see. I mean, it's still, yeah. it's still such early days. It feels like we've been in this limbo period for so long and it's been two weeks at this point. In two the, weeks, in maybe. Like, yeah. I mean, so we're, crazy. we're barely getting started. Yeah. Another yeah. thing Kate says all, all, well, it's actually Kate's mom says all shall be revealed. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> hang hang tight and uh you know don't don't try to answer questions before you have all the information yeah well that's that's good advice so let's let's stop speculating <laughs> Payson. let's talk about orange seal can you tell can you 
tell the audience about the brand of Orange Seal and the off-road team that you're a part of. Yeah, so uh, my relationship with Orange Seal goes back to my Texas roots. They're an Austin, Texas-based company. I come from Austin, Texas. Um, and as they were just in the very early days of their existence, um, I was about 18 years old. And I was one of the very first athletes that they partnered with. We just had a little product deal, um, I think, in my last year as a junior racer. Um, and because of the hometown connection, we stayed in touch. And um, they really showed some dedication to uh, my success, both during the, the ups and the downs. And in a, an industry that often disposes of athletes pretty quickly, Um, that was very attractive to me, even when I didn't know nearly as much about the industry as I do now. Um, and so, uh, I really gravitated towards them and we've just, uh, we've really, um, our trajectories have, have, uh, kind of, uh, gone up in tandem. Um, they're really doing well these days. Um, and, and where, where they are now in comparison to where they were, you know, eight years ago is, is really astounding. I was just at their headquarters uh, a couple days ago, actually. And uh, just, you know, getting a little peek at their inventory and the number of, you know, ginormous pallets of sealant that are going out the door is pretty astounding and, uh, and really cool to see. And um, they, I, I think it's wonderful to be partnered with such a good product, a partner or a, a product that uh, if, our partnership wasn't there one that I would buy anyway. Um, but really the major thing is, is the family atmosphere. Um, they have a level of honesty in the way that they conduct business and treat people that again, I don't want to say is unusual for the industry, but a little bit beyond what's typical. Um, and also, uh, just a, a level of, um, caring like they they genuinely want to be a participant in my and the rest of our riders teams or rest of our riders success um yeah when we're successful I, they're successful yeah and I'll, and I'll speak to that too um having worked one year on the the, the first year that the orange seal team uh, did come out working for john vargas uh john and jen um and they are part owners of orange seal and some of the most genuine people I've ever met in my life. Yep. Uh, truly good people and a fantastic product. So um, the sealant, if you haven't heard of it, I mean, do you, what kind of bikes are, are they running the orange seal sealant in? Yeah, that's kind of the, the cool thing is it, it's such a solid product that I literally use it in every single one of my bikes. I use it in my longer travel mountain bike and I use it on the other end of the spectrum in my road bike. Um, road tubeless is if, folks out there aren't riding road tubeless yet yes there is more <laughs> setup and maintenance involved but um i think I've worth had, it yeah i think i've had to stop and throw a tube in a road tire like once in the last two years and the ride quality is incredible and it's faster like if you run the numbers from a scientific standpoint in terms of rolling resistance um yeah. little little known fact is that uh they're at, they actually roll a lot faster than tubulars and so we're seeing most um, teams in the Tour de France, for example, during time trials are running tubeless tires. Um, I mean, Peter Sagan runs or- Orange Seal. Bora Hansgrohe uh, runs Orange Seal in, in all of their tires year round. Okay. So um, it, it's a really awesome product. And I mean, heck, it works uh, not officially, but <laughs> it works in car tires too. I was out uh, earlier this winter visiting another mutual friend of ours, Larissa Connors. And, uh, <laughs> she, uh, I was staying with her for a couple of days and I walked out the front door one day and I had a flat on my van and I was like, gee, dang it. This oh, is, wow. uh, this is not what I, you know, it's a hassle. And yeah. I called John and I was like, Hey John, I think I remember you saying one time that you, uh, fixed one of the van tires with orange seal. Is that true? And he said, Oh yeah, just take out the valve core, squirt some in there. Air it up to, of course, he has an exact way of doing it. Air it up to 45 PSI, drive it around the block, come back, check it. I bet it's good to go. Literally did that. It was insanely easy. And I have since put like 30, 3,000, 4,000 miles 
uh, on the van and I have not touched it with air since then. Um, holding like a incredible. Car, so. incredible. I mean, if it, if it can hold up in a car tire at 80 miles an hour on a highway, then I think it can basically do anything. <laughs> yeah yeah no i firmly agree and for the audience members out there who have not gone tubeless be it on the mountain bike gravel bike or road what we're talking about is we take the we take the tubes out and you need to have a, a, a tubeless tire and a tubeless wheel uh that's air, airtight essentially and you throw some of this orange seal in and if anything punctures it um, or slices a sidewall whatever, um, that sealant is designed to throw to that area and plug the hole uh, with um, minimal air loss. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, just to bring that to full circle on the sealant. And that's what Orange Seal is. Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, so they fully support the Orange Seal off-road team. And I guess uh, one of the last questions is with the new additions of Hannah Finch Camp and Dennis Van Weeden. Is that how you say his last name? Uh, Van Winden, yeah. Winden. Um, how is it riding with those guys? I don't, I don't know them as, as well as I know, uh, yourself. Yeah, it's, it's been so awesome. Um, yeah, so we have, uh, myself, Kai Cordes, who's kind of our, our development yeah, Kai, rider, right. uh, an Oklahoma based rider who, um, you know, he'd be the first to admit, isn't knocking down national championships like some of the other top junior racers, but is a very solid racer he he actually won the whiskey off-road um for his age group last year and um oh, is, wow. is someone who we sort of identified as uh ha- having a background similar to mine in that they didn't grow up in a cycling hotbed with mountains and trails out their back door and pros to ride with they sort of you know, he's having to pull himself by the bootstraps and, and decide that he really, really wants this. And he's not going to let geography or opportunity get in his way. And, Hmm. um, that's the sort of person that, you know, we want to give a little, uh, a little tailwind to. So, um, he's been awesome the last couple of years. Um, Hannah came to us from the cliff pro team. Um, she was looking for an environment that allowed her to chase both her world cup aspirations, um, and some of the, the longer distance stuff. So she'll be doing a few world cups as well. So she's on, officially on the Olympic long team. Um, and we'll be doing, uh, some world cups, but also obviously doing gravel. And it's been pretty funny, um, to witness firsthand her recognizing the opportunities associated with some of the, the grassroots racing, um, after she won that mid South event, she said she has never been so buried by media requests and (laughs) messages and emails and texts. And she said, she just closed her door um, at her room in her house one day. And all she did was answer messages and do interviews and basically just like be available. And when it kept rolling the second day, she just was like, I have to go ride. And she just put her phone away and just got away from it all. Her Instagram followers like doubled overnight. It was just, it was nuts. And, and she was like, Oh, I get it now. Yeah. yeah. You know, she's, she's, she's medaled at the national championship. She's two time X Terra world champion. She's medaled at plenty of Epic rides events. She's, she's got lots of big results. Um, and it was a gravel event that, that just like blew her doors off. So, um, I thought that was pretty telling. Um, and I'm, I really enjoy being teammates with her because she is really positive and has a, a level of professionalism, um, at only 24 years old. That's really, really impressive. It's clear that she's had some awesome mentors. Um, you know, some of the, the really big names that we know on the cliff cliff team, like Katarina Nash yeah. and Catherine Pendrel, et cetera. It's clear that they're, um, professionalism uh, rubbed off on her some and we just feel really really fortunate to to have her on the team and uh yeah i look forward to being teammates with her for for a long time um and then dennis was brought in somewhat recently um he had a, a very solid career in the world tour for about 10 years racing for rabobank and um uh, uh jumbo visma um, he was uh, a part of some some pretty uh, cool races like Paris Roubaix and Tour of Flanders. He's done plenty of Grand Tours and um, 
he uh, was looking for a change. Um, he's 31, so still very much in his prime, but I think was getting pretty tired of the dangers associated with World Tour road racing. Um, I know he had a, a really severe crash at one point that um, you know he doesn't talk about too much, but uh, it sounds like changed his perspective on things. Um, so basically, we got a World Tour engine uh, in our roster, um, and it's it's pretty awesome. But beyond that, he's just an incredible guy. He's hilarious, fits right in, really lighthearted, um, has the professionalism that you'd expect from someone that spent such a long time in the world tour, but uh, has just a relaxed personality that already is just perfect for the off-road racing world. So it's proven a, a really good fit, and um, his kind of road captain abilities and exp experience um was was really pivotal in um the success at mid-south too so uh he's already been uh really um appreciated well, I'm, I'm super stoked to hear that i mean as i said john john is a good connector of people and and he has uh great visions and i think he's put together another solid team here so i, I look forward to um what 2020 will bring once bike racing is, is back in the, uh, back in the mix of it all. Yeah. So, uh, kind of in, in summary Payson, uh, kind of want to recap what we talked about and then get into our takeaways, which are three questions and I'll, I'll go a uh, little rapid fire at the end of that. But so in, in summary Payson, you know, we've, we've heard your life story, how you got into bike racing, uh, your, how you became an off-road professional athlete, a Red Bull athlete. And as you continue on this journey, where do you see, what's the area that you think you, you should and need to focus on in order to keep on uh, carving this path and becoming a better you than you were before? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a big question and it's a really good question. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think so I've been I'm I'm in a very fortunate position and I've gotten here thanks to a lot of hard work but also thanks to a lot of people that have helped along the way um and and just keeping my eyes and ears open um and and listening and being open minded to those teachers so I think um continuing to adapt and listen to people that I feel like are doing it well um, is big. Uh, one thing that's, that, that brings me a lot of motivation is that I see, you know, every year I'm still getting better physically. Um, and that process is addictive. Like the, there is still in this world, nothing that makes me happier than feeling fitter than I've ever been. You know, one of those rides where, and I had one in California, Earlier this year, it was my last day spent uh, in Marin. Um, I was basing out of Mill Valley. And um, now and then, to kind of cap off a training block, we'll do kind of a, a depth charting mission. So because so many of my events these days require being really good still six hours in, figuring out you know where, where we're at in, in regards to, to getting the fitness to that point. So um, I went on this big, I linked this big gravel uh, loop where I basically tried to put together as many of the dirt roads, <clears throat> um, on the Bolinas Ridge area as possible, Mount Tam area, and basically did, um, tempo on, on every single climb and then, uh, just kept doing it. And I think at five hours, I felt better than I had at hour one. And I just was kind of running out of daylight. And so I thought, well, we'll just do VO two on these last couple of five minute climbs. And I did my, uh, personal best five minute power of the year at hour six after doing like two and a half, three hours of tempo. savage. And I was like, How? I, well, I should probably shy away from cursing, but I was so stoked. And <laughs> I like, you should be stoked. You should probably swear, but like I literally, thanks for not. I couldn't get myself tired. And I was like, this yeah, is incredible. This, this is such a good feeling. And I love this process so much. And every single ride leading up to this day, this winter that has sucked where it was raining and I went out there anyway, or I felt 
really shitty and I got the ride done anyway, every single one of those rides that didn't go well was worth this one ride where it went better than it ever has. And so just chasing that feeling um, is something that I don't think I'll ever really let go of. And so that being addicted to that process um, is is something that I will really prioritize, continue to prioritize as long as I have the opportunity to. Um, outside of that, uh, learning from other sports, um, you know, I do have a lot of interest and uh, motivation to <clears throat> continue to progress on the business side, whether that be, you know, doing more content projects or, um, you know, all kinds of stuff developing, you know, uh, some businesses of my own, um, that are related to my racing career, riding career, all that sort of thing. Those things really, really inspire me. Um, and so, uh, I've never liked the tag entrepreneur because it's so free form and like so many people love to call themselves an entrepreneur. I, I don't think of myself as an entrepreneur cause I'm just doing the stuff that makes me happy and, and makes me motivated. But I guess to many people from the outside, it would look like sort of an entrepreneurial lifestyle. Um, and, and that's what, uh, really fires me up also. So, um, I know that's, I don't know if that's like, uh, overcomplicating the answer, but, um, those are the two, Not at all. those no. are the two things that, uh, make me excited to get up every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Keep driving at home. I like that. I like that a lot. Well, Payson, um, time for our, our takeaways and then we'll make it a wrap. But uh, kind of in this section, I just want to ask um, kind of point blank three questions. And, and this is stuff that our audience can can apply to their lives right now, be it the professional athlete that is listening to this or the professional person that's uh, furloughed yeah. <laughs> or whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the first question is with all this, with, with this extra time right now, if you are, you know, working from home, you know, the job secure and you do have that extra time to train and, and rest is, is what advice would you give to the audience right now? That person who's still healthy, still aiming for some bike racing, what should they be doing in their training? Um, well, it depends on what their goals are, obviously. Um, but let's take a dirty Konzo or a BWR athlete. Now that we know BWR is like late in the season, like for example. Yep. Um, first of all, make sure you have uh, a really good uh, village around you. Um, whether if you have a family, you know, make sure everyone's clear on what your goals are and make sure they're taken care of so that they can take care of you better. Um, so family first. And then also, uh, make sure you have some sort of solid guidance. Um, I know uh, a hands-on coach isn't for everyone, but um, whether it be really educating yourself through your own research or reading some books, reading online, hiring someone like my coach, Christian Williams, or someone like Adam here, um, that will go a really, really long way. And I think trying to create as much structure and certainty around these very uncertain times will go a long way. So we do now have some firm dates. Um, for example, Belgian waffle, like you can build a plan now around that date. Um, Kanza, we're not super sure on yet, but I, I would say that there's nothing wrong with really, really preparing for that date because if it does get moved or canceled, uh, worst case scenario is you built some incredible form, take a little break, uh, and then, you know, uh, catch that wave again. So um, I, I think to, to, to make that point more cohesive, um, take the time now to really make a good plan. Don't wing it day to day. We're winging a lot of things right now day to day, but training shouldn't be one of them. So yeah, so keep that form going with yeah. uh, frequency of exercise, training, and, and keep her going. Yeah, but also you yeah. know don't don't force it. Understand that we also do have time. So if you feel like you want a break right now, take it. Like there's you can spare a week to chill and get your yeah. head right right now. Um, and now, as you did after Mid South, and now you're crushing it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. This one, this question is, is unique. And, and the reason why I want to ask you is, is because, you know, um, being, being a young athlete and having, um, uh, kind of still a heart for Nika living in Durango and things like that. It's, it's for the juniors and their parents out there. And so for the juniors and parents, uh, who are planning a big season, you know, maybe the, the, they were coming on form or they're, you know, that big aspirations for their kid, how should they refocus this year? Oof. That's another great question. Um, obviously first and foremost, follow the guidance of, of, uh, what we're being told will um, most effectively limit the the main problem we're all facing, which is COVID-19. So um, I know we all want to be riding with each other and um, probably the temptation is there to, to get uh, one of these young kiddos set up with uh, a more established rider um, because the time is there, but you know, that's probably not the right thing to do at this point. So um, again, uh, capitalize on what we do have. So communicate with the folks, um, that have the information in regards to, to what makes the most sense, whether that's a coach or a pro that's willing to answer, you know, an Instagram, uh, Instagram DM question, whatever it is, just arm yourself with information and then make a plan. But also, uh, even more so than, than the folks, uh, who are a little bit older, time is on your side. This really sucks right now. It sucks for everybody. Um, but, but recognize in the scheme of things that we have it pretty good here in the United States and try to keep some perspective. Um, don't, uh, don't despair <laughs> when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, looking back on it now, I made so many mistakes. Um, I ignored some things my coach told me to do and it ended up fine. So, um, if you have the opportunity, focus a little bit more on skills, maybe. Um, don't ride yourself into the ground because you think, uh, you have to, um, I would say, you know, just kind of stay the course and as time allows, um, focus on the basics because developing a foundation of basics is one thing that really will pay dividends, uh, when you're, uh, you know, more physically mature, um, 10 years from now or five years from now, whatever it is. Couldn't agree more. Well, the final question is also timely. Uh, it is, Payson, what is your favorite sheltering in place activity right now? <laughs> or is it chasing chickens? Is that, <laughs> yeah, has that become it? I left the chickens behind yesterday. I, I drove back to Durango, <laughs> but um, <laughs> favorite sheltering in place activity. Um, man, these these definitive questions like this are so hard for me because I. I have such a diverse number of interests, but, um, I'll, I'll give one like super traditional canned answer, which is like, what are you watching on Netflix right now? I'm watching that F1 series on Netflix and it's blowing my mind and really making me think about the way I go about my profession and my sport. So that's been super inspiring. Um, F1, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm probably like, everybody will be like, how don't you know this Adam? But like, what is, what is F1? I don't even know. Uh, just the F1 series, or the whatever. car, the car racing. So like, ah, the European ultra stupid fast, like NASA meets race cars. Um, it's like got it. the pinnacle of, 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 uh, of car racing. Hilariously large budgets, um, incredible locations for the races, and uh, just really cool science forward approaches to, to going really fast. Um, I should clarify, I knew what F1 racing was. I didn't know that there was a series on Netflix, just for the people still with their mouth open right now, wondering. I'm very relieved. Where? where? Um, <laughs> I was about to judge. Just want to clarify. That's all. Um, <laughs> beyond that, um, I'm about to remodel a house, or remodel a house, remodel oh, cool. a room in my house. Okay. Um, turn a, a spare bedroom into an office uh, slash recording studio slash Zwift room. Um, so that I feel like you've been talking about that for a while though. Yeah. Well, ever since you bought, well, ever since you I have out. started, I have started, but it's gotcha. I just got back into town yesterday. So, yeah. um, I have, uh, drawings and, um, you know, picking out wood flooring and fun stuff like that. Talking to a, uh, furniture maker that does all these cool like modular uh, pieces since it's a 
relatively small room, want to maximize room. So just kind of making plans. But um, yeah, pretty soon here, I'm going to be tearing out the carpet and scraping the, the uh, I don't even know what to call it, the, the popcorn ceiling off of the ceiling. Mm. That's super yeah. 70s. We don't need that in our life. Yeah. Um, nope, definitely not. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool, man. Well, good luck to your, uh, good luck to all your projects, um, as you shelter in place and train in Durango. But, uh, for those who want to, you know, carry on with the story, I mean, where can they find you on social media? What, what are, where can they find you? Um, I'm at Payson McKelvin on Instagram and Twitter also, but honestly, I don't really use Twitter. I just, uh, read news headlines on it um gotcha really don't use facebook anymore either to be honest it's pretty much all instagram um you can go to youtube um i have a growing youtube channel there just pacing mckelvin um the uh orange seal off-road team uh recently launched a series called family seal which is a kind of behind the barrier style um peek behind the curtain uh youtube series that's just at the orange seal uh, YouTube channel. Um, cool. There's just one up there now, but the second one uh, telling the story of mid South will be coming very soon. Um, and then I guess the other major bucket is just the podcast, which is called the adventure stash. And uh, they are just sort of raw, unfiltered conversations with folks from all walks of life. Definitely lots of uh, high level athletes, but um, yesterday we uh, published an episode with uh, one of the leading authorities on nuclear non-proliferation for example so it's this woman that um, honestly y'all have definitely seen on the news discussing you know weird things that North Korea happens to do one day or you know she addresses the UN so we, we have uh, all kinds of cool conversations on that podcast too so feel free to check out the adventure stash I can personally vouch for the adventure stash. I've been enjoying it. So thank you, Payson, for continually putting out some cool content there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. It's fun. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on the Train Right podcast, Payson. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was fun. It was good to catch up a little bit, Adam.